Hey, what's up guys? Today, I'll show you a crime thriller film, Plagues of Breslau. Spoiler ahead, watch out and take care. The movie begins with the detective crying in her car. When three thugs attempt to prey on her, they immediately leave when they see her gun. She's about to leave when a fat drunkard stops her and continues roaming. Time passes. On Monday, a boy finds a cowhide underneath the table in a marketplace. Minutes later, the police arrive for investigation. The detective and the partner order the shoppers to vacate the area, while the investigation team takes photos. The detective and the partner examine the limousine cattle leather to cut it open and find a squeezed corpse inside. Momentarily, the pathologist arrives and presumes the body expired two hours ago and died from suffocation because fresh hides shrink under the sunlight. The team then stretches out the body to see a brand degenerate on the stomach. The detective realizes the leather is from purebred cattle, which only the registered buyers can buy with official papers and ID numbers in Poland. She orders the partner to search for breeders in the vicinity. Later, the detective cries in front of her fiancé's altar in her apartment. The detective arrives in the health pathology facility, but the reporter outside asks again for a scoop. The detective ignores her and enters the facility. The pathologist examines the corpse, while the district attorney, who's trying to watch the dissection, leaves since he can't handle it. The pathologist theorizes the crime. The perk branded the victim, who was either awake or asleep during the process, with hot iron bent in letters. The perp sewed the victim inside the leather. The leather under the sun shrunk, causing a massive internal hemorrhaging to the victim and thus stopping the circulatory in the heart. The detective comments the perp is a methodical whack job. Afterward, the detective and the partner leave to travel to the barn, where limousine cattle are sold. Outside, they encounter the district attorney, who is buttering up with the reporter. The detective and the partner arrive in the barn, learning one of the cattle is missing. They ask for a list of limousine buyers, and luckily, there's only one. So the two visit a slaughterhouse, interrogating the foreman. The foreman names the victim Bogdan, who worked as a first shift foreman. Bogdan was a drunkard that disappeared from time to time and ran the place of a dictator. Despite the issue against him, the management ignores it. The detective interviews a butcher mistreated by Bogdan. The butcher cries because Bogdan got what he deserved for torturing the employees. For example, forbidding them to go to bathrooms, mandating the usage of adult diapers, locking them up in a freezer and terminating someone every month. On Tuesday, the detective and the partner discuss the potential suspect from multiple angry employees in the car. The detective comments that to find the killer is to dwell in the past. Meanwhile, the clock strikes 6 p.m. An explosion erupts from a building, causing a horse to rampage on the street and panicking the people. The two split up when they receive the urgent radio about a horse found on the bridge and the park. The detective visits the bridge and encounters a racehorse coming towards her. She requests all the police on standby to turn off the sirens because noise excites the racehorse, and by doing that, she successfully calms it down, causing the people to applaud. The reporter commands the cameraman to capture the interaction between the detective and the racehorse. Momentarily, the police come to retrieve the racehorse until she receives another radio from the partner, saying they cornered the horse in the park. On the bridge, a passerby screams upon seeing a corpse with missing limbs and its ankle tied to the racehorse's saddle. The detective sees the corpse and commands her colleagues to block the bridge. The reporter approaches the corpse and captures it, while the detective bolts to her car and drives to the park. She immediately commands the police to turn off the siren upon arriving at the park. The partner and the police surround the other racehorse. But the racehorse kicks the partner's head, causing him to fall, and gets hit again by its hoof land. The police fire a bullet at the racehorse, and the detective checks the partner's vital signs before looking into the next rope tied on the racehorse. At the end of the rope is the corpse's missing limbs. The detective returns to the bridge and receives a hospital call regarding the partner's vital state. Later, the detective is asleep in her car when the police officer wakes her, announcing that the chief police receive a letter from the commissioner, which says that Warsaw CBS will send an expert on violent crime to help with the case. The detective heads to the central station to fetch the policewoman. A woman wearing a cap, short named Ms. Cap, suddenly approaches her. Ms. Cap recognizes the detective through the news broadcast, showing her interaction with the racehorse. Ms. Cap is an expert sent by CBS. Afterward, the detective and Ms. Cap visit the building where the explosion occurred. Upon arriving, the police officer announces Homeland Security has removed the detective from the case due to info explosives commonly used by terrorists. Ms. Cap examines and describes the crime scene oddly perfectly. Here in Polish, possessing replica firearms is legal, including buying gunpowder. She explains that the perp filled two bags with gunpowder, hung them 20 inches in front of each window with an attached cell phone for detonation. Then the perp placed two racehorses facing opposite directions. Two long ropes from their harnesses bound the victim's legs and arms to the middle of the room. 
The building exploded when he called both cell phones simultaneously, causing the horses to run, thus killing the victim due to mutilation. According to Polish law, Ms. Cap concludes the perp used only black gunpowder, and so is not classified as an act of terror. Afterward, the reporter and the cameraman wait for the detective and Ms. Cap to interview, but Ms. Cap confiscates the disc tape from the cameraman because it's an obstruction to evidence. The detective and Ms. Cap enter the facility. The perp's second victim is on the operating table with a plunderer brand on the stomach. Ms. Cap asks if the two victims resemble anything from the city's history. None seems to know, so Ms. Cap shares the week of plagues during the year 1741, led by Frederick the Great while conquering Lower Silesia. He desires to cleanse Breslau to become a European metropolis. So Breslau's executioner publicly tortured and killed people who were found guilty of degeneracy, pillaging, bribery, slander, oppression, and deviousness every day at 6 p.m. Therefore, degenerates died on Monday, pillagers on Tuesday, etc. Sunday was left as a holiday. Upon hearing this, district attorney realizes there will be more deaths and leaves the room. The new victim's face is brutally unrecognizable, but the pathologist will use the fingerprints instead for identification. The racehorses are also confirmed stolen from a local racing stable. Afterward, the detective and Ms. Cap decide to visit the hospital partner. Before entering the car, a man recognizes Ms. Cap, asking her business in the facility. Ms. Cap replies she's a guest, and will call them later. Upon arriving in the hospital, the detective learns the partner's chance of waking up from comatose is none because his brain's shutting down due to damage. The detective enters the partner's room, seeing the wife and son crying beside him. Ms. Cap suddenly shares about the time she almost died from a hornet's sting while massaging his left hand. Ms. Cap was comatose for 10 days and couldn't move while hearing her mother crying. Ms. Cap encourages the wife's strong spirit will give him the strength to fight because Ms. Cap herself is the living proof. On Wednesday, the detective and Ms. Cap visit the racecourse. It was the second victim's usual hangout. They interview the gambler who owed money to the second victim. They learn the second victim was a loan shark with insane rates to pay off. Anyone who refuses the payment will be punished. The detective asks why no one called it in, but the man claims he did. The detective thinks he's lying. Then she realizes the gambler dropped all the charges because the second victim sent the man's genitals in a jar to his wife. The man leaves, saying the police never help anyone. Afterward, the detective accompanies Ms. Cap, who's eating lunch. The detective declines when a stranger asks for a phone. Ms. Cap comments she should have accepted it. Ms. Cap asks how the detective stopped the horse. The detective is supposedly a farm vet and knows a lot about farm animals, but she wants to help people, so she becomes a homicide detective. For Ms. Cap, the detective is lying because no homicide detective can help the dead. The detective snaps, saying the fat drunkard drove while drunk, killing the detective's fiancé, who only left to buy wine. Until now, the fat drunkard remains unpunishable due to political immunity. So Ms. Cap says, and you understand the perp's motives well. Later in an opera house, a musical play occurs when suddenly a woman bound in a wooden pole elevates. The perp, hiding in the shadows, throws a lit match on the woman. The woman screams, but no voice can be heard, and the audience evacuates. Soon, the detective rushes to the opera house and contacts Ms. Cap to head there too. The opera actor looks for the fire extinguisher, but it's gone. Upon arriving, she heads backstage, following the actor's direction. To her surprise, the detective searches backstage and Ms. Cap is there instantly. The two join forces and hear the mechanic's plea trap behind a door. The mechanic explains he saw the perp, who he thought was an actor, and suddenly hit his head. The two bring the mechanic on stage for a witness statement and are surprised to see the fire gone. The fireman explains the victim died due to inhalation of gasoline fumes while screaming, causing the throat and lungs to catch fire. The pathologist inspects the victim's throat to see its vocal cords cut out. The perp's third victim is Rocklow Treasury's director, with a brand corrupt. She was suspected of accepting compensation for turning a blind eye to the illegal activities of 11 companies. However, she was cleared from all bribery charges and prosecution due to insufficient evidence. On Thursday, the detective, the partner's wife, and son visit the partner in the hospital. Upon arriving, Ms. Cap massages the partner's feet because she saw him move his feet. Ms. Cap announces he'll be okay soon and to organize a rehab. The wife approaches the partner and notices his toe move, so Ms. Cap quickly tells her to talk to him as usual. Afterward, the detective and Ms. Cap return to the police, but Ms. Cap leaves saying she'll go to the grocery. When the detective arrives in her office to study the three victims' profiles, the chief summons her to his office. Upon arriving, they learn headquarters never sent someone, which means that Ms. Cap doesn't exist, and she falsified a CBS order, where nobody questioned its validity. Right then, the detective recalls how Ms. Cap arrived quickly in the opera house. 
The detective suddenly receives a call from Ms. Cap, instructing them to step away from the window. The clock strikes 6 p.m., and a fourth victim, tied on the wheel with a brand slanderer, arrives at the window. The detective tries to chase Ms. Cap, but it's too late. They watch the van appear on the station at 4 p.m. in the surveillance room. Ms. Cap came out, bringing a large box containing the fourth victim. The chief orders the police to print out Ms. Cap's image, but all the videos capturing her are covered by her cap. Afterward, the detective reasons not to publish Ms. Cap's image, because they only found out about her real identity through an anonymous call, thus making it not a police discovery. They rewatch all the detective's encounters with Ms. Cap, showing Ms. Cap didn't come from the Warsaw train. The detective shares with the chief that Ms. Cap only saw her from the television. If they reveal Ms. Cap to the public, they'll appear harboring a murder. The detective describes Ms. Cap's face to the sketch artist in her office. After waking up from a nightmare, she calls the chief to inform a way to find Ms. Cap. In the chief's office, the detective presents Ms. Cap's sketch portrait to the man, whom Ms. Cap talked to before outside the facility, revealing Ms. Cap is actually his former deputy supervisor in CBS. He also identifies the fourth victim, his former chief from CBS. They learn the fourth victim's testimony caused Ms. Cap's termination. In the facility, the pathologist explains the fourth victim suffered from heavy hammering on his arms and legs and was killed with a single blow on the larynx, then tied on a wheel. On Friday, the detective and the police visit Ms. Cap's address. They find Ms. Cap's mother and her two children with spinal myositis. Ms. Cap's mother sheds light on their life. The landlord is evicting them due to stacking debts. Her husband left her due to poverty, and Ms. Cap took history and law in university, which is evident throughout the investigation. Ms. Cap's mother unravels the connection between all Ms. Cap's victims. Ms. Cap worked behind paperwork in the militia and supposedly replaced the fourth victim, but he slandered her name, causing her to lose her job. So Ms. Cap worked next in Rocklaw's Department of Treasury under the leadership of the third victim, who intentionally destroyed evidence for companies in exchange for money, holding back criminal cases to pass the statute of limitations. Ms. Cap chose to report the third victim's crime to the Ministry of Finance, but when they organized an investigation committee, they blamed Ms. Cap for whistleblowing and even made her interrogation with the police as entertainment. Ms. Cap then pleaded to the Prime Minister for help, but he never responded. Ms. Cap lost her job in the Treasury, took loans, and gambled it on the second victim's betting horse. But when the second victim lost the bet on his horse, he charged Ms. Cap insane interests. They felt deeply in debt, so Ms. Cap worked 14 hours a day in the slaughterhouse under Bogdan, the first victim's management, where she was abused and locked in a freezer. After the revelation, the detective realizes it's almost 6 p.m. because Ms. Cap's next victim is the landlord. Meanwhile, Ms. Cap traps the landlord with a brand suppressor in a barrel and rolls it down a slope onto the main road. The barrel reaches the highway and gets hit by a car, thus killing the landlord. The detective and police arrive on the highway and find the landlord dead on the side of the road. The detective catches a glimpse of Ms. Cap, calls her team and chases her to an abandoned building near the city port. They spread out, but the moment she's alone, Ms. Cap strikes her head. The detective went missing for two hours. She wakes up in the police station, informing them Ms. Cap had sedated and dumped her like garbage. Afterward, the detective shows to her colleague the Prime Minister's image with a written crook on his forehead. The police immediately go to the Prime Minister's office to show the threat. But the secretary ignores it with confidence, because the Prime Minister can never be involved in any issues. But the detective points out Ms. Cap, the responsible killer of five victims, pleaded for help from the Prime Minister many times but never received support. The detective suddenly shows her phone with Ms. Cap's record of threatening the Prime Minister, which the secretary confiscates for crucial evidence and reassigns the threat to Homeland Security. On Saturday, the Prime Minister and his bodyguards watch a motor race for his birthday. From afar, the detective observes the Prime Minister. Afterward, the audience sings him happy birthday, gives him a motorcycle helmet. He's about to wear it, when suddenly he sees Ms. Cap's beheaded head inside, causing the Prime Minister and his bodyguards to leave. The investigation team brings Ms. Cap's head to the facility, where the pathologist finds a pendrive in Ms. Cap's mouth addressing the Prime Minister. The pendrive reaches the Prime Minister's office and the reporter, who broadcasts the exclusive pendrive's content on the news. The content is Ms. Cap's video requesting the Prime Minister to explain to her children why they lost their mother and how he did nothing despite all her pleas for help. The movie ends by revealing the truth during the detective being missing for two hours. Before decapitating herself, Ms. Cap instructed the detective to help her continue the plan. The insurance money for Ms. Cap's death helped Ms. Cap's mother and children to move out and pay the medical bills. After Ms. Cap's death, the detective visits the partner who woke up from a coma, and the wife thanks her. 
The plan involved the detective fabricating the crook on Prime Minister's photo, allowing the secretary to confiscate her phone, placing Ms. Cap's head onto the motorcycle helmet, and giving the pen drive to the reporter for broadcasting Ms. Cap's story. When a stranger asks for a photo, the detective accepts it. Ultimately, the detective finally attacks the fat drunkard that appeared from the beginning for vengeance. This is Daniel CC Movie Channel. Stay safe and enjoy your day.